my root, my support, and my strength. Without them, life would be tasteless, pointless, purposeless, and dry. No nourishment, no fulfillment, just me holding myself up. But when my roots are in Him, I am unstoppable. Because when I hit my knees in prayer or open His word, I know I'm not talking to something that is weak and powerless, foreign or non-existent, but I'm tapping into someone, the one, who is sovereign and gracious, bold and victorious. He hears my faith and He knows my name. He has a magnitude and I have the ability because of Him that is in me. These are my roots. I find my purpose when I worship Him, my belonging when I share Him. I am defined by Him, and it's in Him you find my roots. Repeat this after me. 2016 is my year to flourish. That's been our, that's been the vision that God gave us, and we are declaring that this year. And we have said, we, we said this along with that, that to, to flourish, you have to be planted. And if you were with us last weekend, we made this declaration that to be planted, you have to be rooted. Everyone say rooted. And so if you're wondering why there's a tree growing out of the middle of the stage, it's because uh, it's our prop for this, this series, and we're talking about being rooted. And Jeremiah says this, that a, a man who trusts God is blessed. And he puts his roots down, and they spread out to the waters. It's planted by the waters, and the roots spread out. And in the time of drought, in the time of heat, he does not have to worry because he will continue to have fruit. His leaf will continue to be green. So no matter what happens in this crazy, jacked up, messed up world that you live in, we can still flourish. In, in a year when politics and economics and health scares and everything else is going on in the world, we can still flourish. And so we are we're declaring that, and so... Uh, uh, we looked last week as we kicked this series off, and we talked about what, what are the reasons for roots? What, what do roots do? And we found out they did these three things. The first thing that a root does, and some roots go down 200 feet. And, and, and let me say this, and this, this is an amen moment. Um, as you see this tree up here, you see the, you see the, 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 the height of the tree, and you, you, you usually you, you see all the branches, and that represents your life. But what you don't see is what's under the surface. And there is more going on under the surface than you can often see. And in your life, if you've ever wondered, if God's working, he's working under the surface. And if something wasn't happening significant under the surface, there couldn't be something significant happening above the surface. So there's some significant things happening underneath the surface that you can't see. And that's the root system. The first thing that roots do is roots absorb the water, and they absorb the nutrients that are in the soil, and it works as a plumbing system that takes the water and nutrients up to all the branches. The second thing that roots do is they anchor a tree, and so that's how a tree can stand in a windstorm or in a hurricane or in a storm. A tree that is rooted well and established, it will stand, just like your life will stand if it's rooted. If it isn't rooted, it will be uprooted by the first storm that comes your way. The third thing that, uh, that the root system does is it actually arms that tree. And what I mean by that is that, that nutrients and the water is actually stored in that tree for when it's needed. And it secretes a chemical that kills all of these microorganisms that would try to destroy the root system. And so you say, why, why, are, you, why are you teaching us about agriculture? Well, that's not the point to the series. I'm teaching you this because of the, uh, I'm making an illustration that we need some spiritual roots if we have some spiritual roots, we'll begin to absorb, we'll be anchored, and we'll be armed, and we can withstand the test of time, the test of storms, and any challenge that you go through. Amen. Amen. And so last week, we, we just began to talk about uh, uh, being rooted, and, and, the, and we have about, uh, including today, three, three weeks or four weeks total in the series. And so last week, we talked about how to be rooted in the Word of God. And so if you weren't here last weekend... I mean, the, the, the speaker was awesome. He was on fire, and um, he talked about being rooted into the Word. And we learned this. Uh, we learned how to receive God's Word. We learned how to declare His Word, and we learned how to do His Word. And we know we're supposed to read the Word. We know that. But how do you work the Word and use the Word? We learned that last week. So if you weren't here, I want to encourage you, go to the website, check it out, watch it so you can catch up with that. And today I'm, I'm going to uh, continue this series. And so I brought, something, I brought something with me here today. I brought my, my gym bag, and I'm going to... 
I'm going to steal them. I'm, I'm going to use Colton, since you're sitting up here. If you could come up here. This is Colton. This is my friend Colton. Um, <laughs> most people just call him the beard. But um, so, so some of you I, may not get this illustration, but um, I, I think most of, of you will. Uh, and, and I think there's some guys in here that will really get this illustration. Have you ever been to the Y or to the gym or to the park, and you're about to step on the court just to play some pickup basketball? And so Colton's going to help me here. Colton, uh, I know a little bit about Colton. He, he's a bicyclist, he, he, a cyclist. He rides bicycles a lot. He runs a lot. Um, if I just was sizing him up, um, he doesn't really take me as the basketball player. Um, maybe you are. I don't know. Maybe we want to prove that sometimes, see what you got. But anyways, um, so, so you're, you're the basketball player, okay? So um, Colton uh, has the basketball. Maybe he steps out at the Y onto the gym, onto the court, or he steps out at the park. And I, and I see Colton coming. Now, um, have you ever seen this guy step out of the, onto the court? Go ahead and put those on there, Colton, if you would. Um, and, and so my point is he may not look like much of a, a ball player, but the guy who gets out with the sweatband and the wristbands, you, you sort of get the impression that this guy is about to really work really hard. He's about to get his sweat on. So it's usually the guy you don't want to guard because he sweats profusely. <laughs> but so kind of gives you the image. This guy is serious about playing. But when, when this guy, every park has one, every Y has one, every, every pickup game has this guy, and when you see this guy come out and put these on, when he puts the knee pads on, th there's just something you have to know. No matter what he looks like, no matter how good he is, no matter how not good he is, when the dude puts the knee pads on, you know that he has come to play some ball. And what I mean by that is he's going to dive after every loose ball. He's the guy that's going to guard you, and he's going to be stepping on you. He's going to be posting you up, boxing you out. He's going to be elbowing you. How many have ever seen this guy at one of the courts? I mean, it's just, it's that guy. And he, 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 he may not be that talented at basketball, but when he puts the knee pads on, you know, this is what I'm going for. He's going to give it everything he's got. And like in Christianity, there's some bones. There's a jawbone, and that's just usually the talkers. And, and there's, there's, the, uh, there's, there's the tailbone, that's just the sitters who don't do much. But it, in Christianity, one of the strongest bones is the knee bone, and here's why. What, what if, not, not literally, but what if we were serious about pulling out our spiritual knee pads and getting on our knees and learning to pray? You, you may not look the part. I mean, if I picked him, you know, uh, some of you might know Jamal who goes here, and he's like this tall. He's a basketball coach. And so um, if I brought him up, he would look the part. But, but Colton's not as tall, and he rides a, a, a bicycle or a tricycle or whatever you do. Um, I, I'm, I'm kind of picturing you as a speed walker right now. You know that guy? But, 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 but no matter if he steps on the court with the knee pads, you know he's, he's serious. Thank you. Everybody give it up for Colton. So I was thinking, what? What if we were just as serious about prayer? So I want to talk this morning about being rooted in prayer. And I want to tell you that this is something over the years I've had to kind of work and develop in my life. Um, I remember when I was younger, I, I heard this message. And it was taken from this story in the Bible where Jesus said, couldn't you tarry and pray an hour with me? And so I heard my youth pastor one time preach a message about praying for an hour. And so I thought, okay, i got to pray for an hour. And so it was kind of like this. I got my, I got my, um, my music out and, and put my, uh, uh, at that time it was cassettes. Has anyone ever seen a cassette? Okay. And so put the cassette on and, and you got your, your worship music and you, you got your Bible and your journal out. And you, 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 everyone else is away. You've locked yourself in a room and, and you, you stretch a little bit just to get ready because you're about to pray an hour. And so you take off praying, God, you're awesome. Thank you for this. And you're praying, and you're praying with all your guts and all your passion because you're about to be just pray for an hour. And, man, you're just laying it out there. And you take a glance at your watch, and you've prayed for like seven minutes. And you've got nothing else left to say. Anyone ever been there? I remember in, in college, it was kind of a New Year's resolution. And me and a, a friend who played on the basketball team together, um, kind of a great big guy, and he said, uh, we, we said, we're going to get up early. Like 5.30, 6 o'clock in the morning. I'm coming over to your dorm room, and we're going to pray every morning. First morning, I'm halfway awake. I'm walking over to his dorm. I sit down on the edge of his bed. He's sitting here, and we just start praying. And like 45 minutes later, I wake up laying on him, and he's laying there. I'm like, hey. <laughs> uh, 
couldn't make it. And so this is what I learned. I, it's not an issue of how long you pray. It's not an issue of it has to be an hour. Really, here's the best thing I can tell you about prayer is just make some time and just do it. If it's 10, 15, whatever it is, just to start to learn to pray. Because what the devil wants to tell you is you can't pray, you don't know how to pray, and he'll just talk you out of, of, out of praying. And so I just want to challenge you. We all know we're supposed to pray. We know we're supposed to read the Bible. But So what I want to teach you today is just a few things about how to root yourself in prayer. And, and listen, I, I'm not here to tell you how long or where or any of that, but I want to give you three things today that I think will really boost your prayer time. I think it will make you eager to go, to go pray. And, and now, my wife can, can, can just pray for, for, she can sit down and just pray forever. And my mom's the same way. And it's awesome, except for at mealtime. Because <laughs> they, they start praying, and then it's like, Lord, we just thank you for this food. And sin revival, God. Touch America. We pray for the elections, God. We pray for, and da, 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 I'm like, I just want to eat my nuggets. I just want to eat the dinner. So for, for those of you who are just spiritual giants and you pray for hours, just amen your way through. For the rest of us, I think I just want to help you this morning. Here we go. Luke, uh, Luke chapter Luke chapter 11, uh, is a very interesting passage of scripture, and it reads this way. Now it came to pass as he was praying in a certain place, talking about Jesus. When he ceased, one of his disciples said, Lord, teach us to pray, even like John taught his disciples to pray. And that's a really interesting verse of scripture because the disciples had been hanging out with Jesus. And they saw Jesus raise dead people. They saw Jesus heal blind people. They saw Jesus um, touch cripples and they were made well. They saw him touch leprosy, which had no cure at the time, and they were healed. And you would have thought they might have asked Jesus, could you teach us how to raise dead people? Could you teach us how to heal blind people? But no, what did they ask? They said, teach us to pray like you're praying. Teach us to pray efficiently or teach us to pray effectively. Now, it's interesting. Out of all that they could have asked for, they said, Lord, obviously they saw a prayer lifestyle in Jesus, and they wanted to be taught to pray that way. Verse 2, so he says to them, so when you pray, and I'm about to read through a prayer that we've all probably prayed, and, and I always remember this prayer in a, in a kind of a silly way, but in high school, right before we would walk out of the locker room to take the field in football, our coach would just start praying this prayer, and we would all just pray along, and it was just kind of routine, and it was always weird to me, because as soon as he said amen, he would just go into a cussing frenzy, go out there and kick there, get out there, and it was like, so it was amen, and just this cussing fest, so I had to learn to separate those two things, um, so every time I read this prayer, it takes me to a weird place, but, but so it says this, and, and you're welcome to just pray right along, but Jesus said, when you pray, say this, our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done. On earth as it is in heaven, give us this day our daily bread and forgive our sins as we also forgive everyone who is indebted to us. And do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. And I'm not going to particularly teach on that. I think we understand the attitude and the motivation behind that. But verse 5 goes on and it starts to show us what I think the key that Jesus was getting at. And he said to them, so which of you have a friend and would go... Uh, to midnight and say to him, friend, lend me three loaves, for a friend of mine has come to me on his journey, and I don't have anything to set before him. And he'll answer from within, and he'll say, do not trouble me, the door is shut, my children are in bed, and I cannot rise and give to you. So I say to you, though, he will not rise and give to him because he is his friend, yet because of his persistence, he will rise and give him as many as he needs. So there's a story Jesus tells in the middle of this, and, and Jesus says, you have a friend who's come from a journey and he's come to your house, but you weren't expecting him, so you didn't have any bread for him. So you go next door to your friend's house and you knock, but the friend says, I can't come to the door. We're all bedded down for the night. My kids are in bed. I don't have anything to give you. Well, if you were in that situation, the Bible says you would continue to knock and you would be what? Persistent. I, I want you to re remember that word persistent because really it means consistent. And Jesus goes on and he says what I think is the key here, verse 9. So Jesus said, so I say, with, with consistency in context, he says, I say to you, ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and it will be opened to you. For everyone who asks, they what? And he who seeks, and to him who knocks, it will be, if a son asks for bread from any father among you, will he give him a stone? Or if he asks for 
fish, will he give him a serpent? Or if he asks for an egg, will he offer him a scorpion? Well, of course not. If you, being evil, know how to give good gifts to your kids, how much more will the Heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask of him? So Jesus shows us, I believe, the key for us to learn to pray. And he says these few things. Consistently ask. And if you consistently ask, you're going to what? Receive. Consistently seek. And if you do, you'll find. Consistently knock, and it will be open to you. Now, let me explain the context of this. Um, if there was something that you are, that's do you, you all remember a commercial a few years ago where the lady sticks her head out the window and she's like, it's my money and I want it now. Y'all remember, anyone remember that commercial? She was declaring there's something there and it's mine. This is the idea that Jesus is talking about. Let me give you my definition of prayer. This is what I believe prayer is. Prayer is interacting with God and inviting his purposes into your life and into the earth. Interacting with God and inviting his purposes into our life and into the earth. There are some things God wants to get into the earth. How does he get them here? The Bible says we invite them by prayer. There are some things God wants to get into your life. How do you get them there? Well, I've got to learn about them. I stand in faith and I pray. I ask. They don't just happen because God loves you. We have to believe, receive. We have to seek to find, we have to knock, so those doors would be open. Now, if you went up to someone's house, if you came down after the experience was over in my office, and you knocked on my office door, why would you knock? Because you were expecting that I would what? Open the door. If you were, uh, I, I sort of lose my keys every day, like three times a day. And so when I go to look for them, I'm seeking them to find them, because I got to have my keys, right? And if you're asking, the word ask in the New Testament it really means this, to demand something that's due to you. To demand something that's due to you. So when you see ask, seek, and knock, it's not just like a, light, a lighthearted event. It, it means you are knocking for a door to open. You're seeking to find that thing which is promised to you. And you're putting a demand, not, on, not bossing God around, but you're putting a demand for God to show you and open some things to you that he desires for you to have. The Bible says this, every promise in the Bible is yes and it's amen. amen. What, what does that mean? That means this, if there's a promise in the Bible, it's for you. And so when you seek and knock, you, you see where I'm going? There's something there that God wants to get into your life. He wants to get into the earth. So you're seeking, you're knocking, is to open those things. So doesn't that change how we think about prayer? It's not some wishful whatever's going on, God do whatever. It's saying there's some things God wants in my life. There's some things God wants in my church. There's some things God wants in, in the earth. And how do I do that? I knock for God to open them. I ask for God to give them. I seek God to find those things. And we're asking. In other words, uh, listen to this. The Bible tells us that healing is the bread of his children. If you have a physical challenge, what do we begin to do? We begin to seek healing. We begin to what? Knock on the door of healing. How about this? You're going through a season. Maybe you're fighting some depression. And in your life, you need some peace. You need some joy. Then what do, you, what do we need to be doing? Knocking on the door that opens up what? Some joy. That opens up some happiness. That opens up the presence of God. That opens up some peace. So God is saying this, there are some promises, there are some blessings, there are some benefits, and what God, what God is asking us is he wants to get them in your life, and he wants to get some purposes into this planet, on this earth. How does he do that? By men and women of God like you and me that are willing to knock on that door. The Bible says you have not because you have not what? Asked. Mm. So being rooted in prayer this is what they asked Jesus. Teach us to pray. And we know this, that we always pray to the Father in the name of Jesus with the help of the Holy Spirit. To the Father in the name of Jesus with the help of the Holy Spirit. So I want to share with you, uh, when, in context, consistency and efficiency in praying. And I've got three things for you this morning. Are you ready for them? They're going to help you get rooted in your prayer life. And when we're done today and you go home, last week I sent you home how to learn to work the word. I'm going to send you home this week. And, and, and when you go home this week, you're going to be able to, you're going to, be able to pray more effectively, more efficiently. Because here's what I know. The devil wants to tell you that you don't know how to pray. He wants to tell you that you won't get answers. He wants to tell you that, well, you've got a, you've got a bad track record, or you've got some failed relationships, or you've done some wrong. Those things are not prerequisites for the goodness of God. Grace 
and the mercy of God are the prerequisite. The Bible said, come boldly before the throne of God and receive mercy and grace. Why mercy and grace? Mercy is when you don't get what you deserve. Grace is when you get what you don't deserve. In other words, mercy is when you don't get the punishment. Grace is when you get the goodness. And the Bible said we can come frankly and we can come boldly into the presence of God. You don't have to go through a priest. You don't have to go through certain things. You go right to Jesus. All right, let, let's learn to pray. Y'all ready? Somebody say, I'm ready. Okay, you, oh, you guys convinced me. All right, first life point is this. Effective praying, effective praying is consistently calm. Effective praying is consistently calm. You say, why, why do you say calm? Well, first of all, Remember who you're praying to. You're praying to the Father, who is a good, good Father. And if you know He's a good, good God and He's a good, good Father, you can come calmly. He's not a bad Father like some of you may have experienced in life. He's a good God. He's a loving God. He has good things for you. He has good things to bestow in your life so you can come calmly. Now, when I say calm, I do not mean with less excitement or less intensity. Here's what I mean by calm. There may have been times that we have prayed prayers that were, that were full of worry, that were full of doubt, that were full of fear, and those are worthless prayers. They are worthless prayers. But when we come before God with a calmness about us, I'm going to prove it to you, a calm. So G the disciples are asking Jesus, teach us how to pray effectively. And so Jesus says, ask, seek, and knock. We pray efficiently by consistently praying calm. What I mean is we don't have to pray freaked out. All right, let me prove it to you. Let me prove it to you. Okay, I got enough proofs. Okay, here we go. So, so worrisome, anxious, stressed out prayers, fearful prayers are worthless. Philippians chapter 4, verse 6 and 7. Verse 6, be anxious for what? Anxious. What does anxious mean? Stressed. Worrisome. Doubtful. Don't be anxious about nothing. Look at someone said, nothing means nothing. Don't be anxious. Anyone ever been anxious? Like you know God cares, but still you, you get a little anxious, you get a little stressed. Yeah, am I talking to the right crowd? A little stressed. Stressed backwards spells dessert. You know that, don't you? So don't be stressed, but about everything, look what it says, but in everything by what? Prayer. Now, the word prayer here it is what it means. It means to come up close into close contact and make an exchange. So don't be stressed about anything, but come close to the Father and make an exchange. And it goes on and says, so in everything by prayer and supplication. How many of you used that word this week, supplication? There's a few of you that probably, I believe you might have used it, but I didn't use that word this week. You can use it this week. You sound really smart. But it says by prayer by coming into close contact with prayer and supplication. Supplication means there's something lacking in your life, and you have an urgency about you, and you have some intensity about you to, to, to go and receive that. So you're stressed about something, but the Bible says don't get stressed. Come into contact with someone that you can make an exchange. Talking about Christ is you can make an exchange, and you can give up your lack for his overflow. You can give up what's missing for what he has in excess. So by prayer and supplication, I love this, with thanksgiving. Well, why would you pray with thanksgiving unless you have a certainty that you're about to receive what you're knocking for? So I'm about to knock on the door of peace, but I'm excited about the peace. You've got to be able to picture it. You've been stressed. I mean, you've been, you've been down and out with some things. You've been dealing with a situation over and over, and it's kept you up at night, and it's, you've had restless moments, and your mind's spinning, and your heart's pounding, and, and you're stressing over it. And the Bible says don't get into that mode, but come before him consistently calm and, and get to the one who you can make an exchange with. And the Bible said by prayer and by supplication with thanksgiving. If I'm about to open the door and I know there's a promise of peace and I need peace right now, I'm going to have an anticipation when I knock on that door and that door opens, I'm going to receive peace. Because I can't, I, I might be able to go sit in the corner and do me some mm, meditation and do some stuff to try to get some peace. But to get some real peace that passes all understanding, that's the door I'm knocking on. That's the promise I'm knocking on. And I do that in prayer. That's why I said you put the, you put the prayer knee pads on. You're serious. 
Come on, if you're tired of something, sometimes you've got to get tired of something being in your life. Sometimes you've got to get tired of depression being in your life. Sometimes you've got to get tired of lack being in your life. Sometimes you've got to get tired of sickness being in your life and say, there's a promise there, and I'm going to knock, I'm going to seek. God's going to reveal something. He's going to open a door. With thanksgiving, let your requests, and that word request means with some authority. Let your requests be known to God. You want to have some things that just steals your peace? L look what happens in prayer when you do that. And the peace of God, which surpasses all of your ability to understand, is going to come and guard your heart and going to guard your mind in Christ Jesus. It's going to come and guard your heart. It's going to come and guard your mind when you do that in prayer. Now, that, that exchange part, here's why it's so important. The Bible said, take all your cares and cast them on him because he loves you. Uh, the word care there means, it means a couple of things. It means the things in life that really stress you and the people that you're concerned about. The word care is the same word where we find that the word says, don't take concern over eating and drinking because God will take care of you. Don't take concern. It also is the same word in the uh, parable of the sower where the, where the weeds and the thorns choked out the word. It's the same word care. There are some cares in life trying to choke out the promises of God, trying to check out the, choke the blessings of God, trying to choke out the great things God wants has for you, and the Bible says we got to be able to take those cares and cast them on him. But the word cast here means to fling them violently. Mm. So in prayer, we take our anxiety and stress and we fling it over on him violently. Not one of these. I wonder where it's going to land. Violently, they're yours, God. You're not made physically proven to carry those weights and carry those stresses. That's why Jesus said, take on my yoke, take on my anointing. It's lighter than yours. We do that in prayer. And when that happens, peace comes. It passes understanding. You can't explain it. You can't purchase it because he already purchased it. It's a promise. And it just will come if you allow it to come. The Bible said consistently being calm when we're praying. Because here's what happens. Stress gets on us, anxiety gets on us, our mind starts spinning, we lose sleep, we can't function normally, and it's like a thousand pounds on us. And if we can't deal with it, we start to pray fretful prayers and wrong prayers. And our prayers come out of our fretful disposition, and they're really worthless prayers. The Bible said calm. Now here's where I'm going with this. Calm, why? Because I'm praying to the Father. Did you hear what I said? I'm praying to the Father. I'm praying to the Father. i got to keep moving here. Ready? That's the first one. Second way that we pray that I believe the Bible shows us here is effective praying is, con is consistently confident. It's consistently calm and it's consistently confident. Consistently confident. That means wavering and wandering prayers are also worthless. But confident praying. I'm trying to help you this morning. Am I helping somebody? James, look what James says, chapter 1. It says this, if any of you lacks wisdom, there are certain times we all lack wisdom, we lack understanding. You could insert anything in here. If any of you lack peace, if any of you lack hope, if any of you lack strength, and if any of you lack, let him ask. Once again, the word ask means you are putting a demand on something that is due you. Let him ask of God who likes to give liberally and without reproach, and it will be given to you. But let him ask what? In faith, with no doubting. For he who doubts is like a wave of the sea, driven and tossed by the wind. For let not that man suppose he will receive anything from the Lord, because he's double-minded and he's become unstable in his ways. So the Bible is telling us this, pray with some confidence. Hear the word, you get confidence. How do we pray? We pray in faith. If it is a promise of, if it's a promise of God, you can pray in confidence that God wants you to walk in it. And if you're not walking in it, the Bible says, come before God. Come before God if you're lacking and ask of him, but don't get into doubt. That's why you got to keep in the word. You got to keep, God wants me to walk in this. 
God doesn't want, doesn't want me to walk in depression. God wants me to walk in freedom. God w- doesn't want me to live in addiction. He wants me to live in freedom. That's the will of God for you, plan of God for you. If you're lacking in that, er- in that way, consistently, I'm going to come before God. I want to see this happen in my life. I'm going to walk in obedience, and I'm going to knock on that door. I'm going to ask. And if it's not happening, can I listen to me on this? Everyone hear me? If it's not happening, people will come say, oh, I-, I tried it, Pastor. It didn't work. Well, why did this happen? Here's, here's the thing I, I feel like we don't ask God sometimes, because this has been my answer to some people, because I don't know all the time. I could give you some ideas. I might pray it out. God would tell me what to tell you. You wouldn't want to hear that anyways. So here's what, here's, sometimes we just need to say, God, why? And be ready for the answer. God might say, because you need to forgive somebody. God might say, because your attitude needs to change. God might say, because you need to let something go. God said, because you might need to do this, you might need to do that. And if you do it, God can change it like that. But we got to be willing to what? Ask, seek, knock. I think the problem, and, and everybody say this, say, we know you love us. Okay, so remember you just said that. I think some of the time, listen to me, we don't want it bad enough. We think we do, we say we do, but would we be willing to change our thinking and our living and walk in some obedience and passionately get right with God and say, I'm going to let that go. I'm going to leave that alone. I'm going to change my thinking. God, you said it. I'm going for it. If we're willing to do that. mm. But confidence, coming consistently in confidence before God. Mark says, when you ask, believe, and you will, what? Receive. Look at 1 John chapter 5, verse 14 and verse 15. This is the confidence we have in him. If we ask anything according to his will, if it's in here, this is his will. If we ask anything that's in his will, we know this. First of all, he hears us. Isn't it good to know that you've got the ear of heaven? If it's in here and you ask, he hears And if we know he hears what we ask, we know we have the petitions we have asked of him. Now, I I did a little studying on that, and I wrote this down, so I want to read this to you. Ready for this? What this means is there's an openness that stems from freedom and a lack of fear to speak. That's what this means here when it says to ask. That you, there's an openness that comes from a freedom, and you have no fear to speak out and ask. I think that's pretty cool. This confidence is energized by the spirit inside of you. And what it means is if ask means that you're asking for something with a sense of urgency, even to the point of demanding. And here's where people freak out. Oh, you're telling us to just boss God around? No, but God's telling you, put a demand on the promise. God wrote this. I didn't write this. He said, that's what the word ask means. Ask. Put a demand on something that's due you. Well, I'm not worthy. No, but he made you worthy. Well, Pastor, you don't know. I have some failed relationships. I I don't always think right. I'm I'm not done everything right. That's not the prerequisite. The prerequisite is the grace and the goodness of God. God honors and he rewards why? Faith, not perfection. God honors faith, not perfection. Have you ever seen somebody, and this, this freaks out, people would have been walking with Jesus for a while, they struggle with this. There's some things maybe you want to see happen and they didn't happen or not happened yet, and someone comes in and give their life to God and two weeks later, they get the very thing they asked for that you'd been asking for. You're single, you've been, you've been praying, Jesus, give me a man, I want a man, I'm standing for a man, standing for a man, or a woman, whichever one you are, and, and, and it hasn't happened. Someone came in, they got, they got saved in service like three weeks ago, and they, start, they hear us preach, believe God for this, and all of a sudden they're praying, give me a man, and they get a man like two weeks later. You've been waiting for like seven months. This is the way you tell the story. He rewards faith. Faith. Because when you come to Jesus, all you know is the grace of God. All you know is the grace of God. Because of the grace of God, you got saved. Because of the grace of God, you're the target for his goodness. But somewhere when we get walking with Jesus for a while, it becomes all about our performance. And we forget that it started as grace and it continues as grace. We just lose that focus somewhere. Oh, y'all doing it right? So prayer, being rooted in prayer, we pray consistently calm. We pray consistently confident. 
And then this last one I want to talk about is going to be fun for the next few moments here. That we effectively pray in cons- we effectively pray consistently courageous. Calm, confident, and courageous. Everyone say courageous. There's a, a, a story in Acts chapter 4, the end of that chapter that I love. But we got to back up a little bit. In Acts 1, or at the end of the Gospels, the Bible said Jesus is walking with his disciples. And he said, listen, it's better that I leave. Now, can you imagine Jesus saying, hey, I know we're raising dead people. We're, we're, we're reaching people. The crippled are getting healed. But, but, but it's better that I go. That's not what they were wanting to hear. And Jesus said, it's better that I go because the same identical spirit is going to come. Why was it better that Jesus went? Because Jesus was only in one place at one time. But he said, my spirit's going to come, and my spirit's going to fill people, and he's going to get on the inside of people. That's why it was better that Jesus went. But he said, the same helper, the exact same comforter, the same spirit, the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit's not an it. It's Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. He is a person just like God and Jesus. And so... uh, in Acts, Jesus said, wait, and you'll be filled with the Spirit. So all of a sudden, Peter, who had denied Jesus, got filled with the Spirit. Remember last time we saw him, he was coward. He was hiding out. But now he's filled with the Spirit. He preaches the first altar call in history. And like thousands of people come to Jesus. And the church starts. And so here's what was going on. The religious people brought in the disciples, and they threatened them. They didn't beat them because they knew the crowds would mob them. So they, they, they bring in the disciples, and they threaten them. Don't preach in his name. See, they thought they'd killed Jesus, but now we got these disciples preaching the same thing, healing people just like Jesus did. And they threaten them, and they said, don't, name, don't use that name Jesus ever again. And so they threaten them. And they come back, the Bible said they came back to the rest of the followers at that time. Now, you would have thought they would have came back and prayed a prayer like this. Oh, Jesus, it's tough out there. Oh, good Lord, it's tough out there. You, you, see, you see our struggle. It, it just put a force field around us, if you would. Just a force field around us and, and just keep us dry and, and protected. And we don't like the threats and just make everything cushy for us. They didn't pray that prayer. You read, here's the prayer they prayed. Father, you know the threats. You've heard their violent threats against us, but stretch your hand out to move through us. Let the Holy Spirit move through us. Heal people through us. Let your word go forth. Doesn't matter what their threat was. And the Bible said the place where they were at shook. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit. And they went forth and they proclaimed the word of God boldly. What if we prayed that prayer? Man, what if we prayed, God, you, you, you see the world we live in. You, we're dealing with ISIS, and we're dealing with government. We're dealing with this law and that law. God, it doesn't matter. God, just stretch your hand out through the church and shake the church and let the passion fall on the church and let your Holy Spirit move through the hearts of us and use us so we're not about us, but we're about continuing the kingdom business. What if we prayed a prayer like that? What if we pray to prayer? God bless my business so much that I can fund a missionary myself somewhere across the seas. Wow. Nothing wrong with God blessing you, but when we start praying prayers like that, it, 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 it'll do what happened. Courageous prayers. They were filled with the Holy Spirit and they were filled with boldness. Now I want you to think about this. The most powerful force on the earth is the Word of God. The Bible said that God spoke the word and created everything. We have power in our words. The Bible said we speak and we frame our world by our words. What if somehow your words were always the words of God? Think about how powerful that would be. Well, the Bible says this, when we are filled with the Holy Spirit, we're actually praying out and speaking not our words, but the words of God himself. Weak prayers are also worthless prayers. How about we start praying some courageous prayers? Now, um, have you ever noticed this? The greatest tactics of the devil, I'm almost done here, stick with me. The greatest tactics of the devil are lies, fears, inferiority complexes, unbelief, doubt, rejection, depression, and ignorance. Some of the greatest tactics of the devil. But the Bible said when we get born again and if we receive the Holy Spirit. Now the first sign is to pray in tongues. 
And the Bible says when you get filled with that, it starts to demolish the insecurities, the depression, the ignorance. It just, why? Because the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of Jesus is inside of you. And if the Spirit of Jesus is in you and He propels your prayers, you're not praying the prayers of your flesh, you're praying the prayers of heaven. So what I want to do for just, just a moment here, you, please understand this. I, I, I could do weeks on prayer. I could do weeks on being filled with the Holy Spirit. And I'm just putting it in kind of like a little fragment of time here for you. So we know this. We can pray consistently calm and consistently confident. But I want to challenge you. Let's pray consistently courageous. So I want to tell you r- real quick here. The Bible says this. Be, be saved, be baptized in water. And be filled with the Holy Spirit. And the initial sign of being filled with the Holy Spirit is to pray in other tongues. Now, it's crazy the controversy that's around praying in tongues. It's crazy. Because the devil wants to keep you from God's best. Do you understand when the church started, they didn't have like, well, we believe in this. They just were filled with God's power. Somewhere along the line, we've gotten all religious and and messed this up. But But I will make you this guarantee. To get filled with his spirit, you'll see your faith life and your prayer life and your walk with Jesus just be enveloped and infused with strength, infused with strength. It'll change you from the inside out. And so what I want to do is I, as I wrap this up, I want to go to 1 Corinthians and show you these real quick things that happen when we pray in the Holy Spirit. 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse 2. For he who speaks in tongues does not speak to men, but he actually speaks to God. For no one understands him, however, in the Spirit he speaks mysteries. The Bible says when first thing, when we pray in the Holy Spirit, we're enabled. Enabled for what? Well, we're enabled to pray out mysteries in secret. What's a mystery in secret? Well, if you're a single person, maybe a mystery in secret is who you're supposed to marry. Maybe if you're a young person, a mystery in secret might be what your career is supposed to be. Maybe you're in a situation you need wisdom, a mystery in secret, you don't know what, you don't know what decision to make. You don't know what's next. The Bible says when we pray in the Holy Spirit, we, there are things we pray out. They're not our prayers. God prays through us. Think about it, if God prayed through you, you wouldn't be, have you ever looked at a situation and you're like, I don't even know how to pray, I feel so limited, I don't even know where to go, what direction, I, I don't even know how to pray in this, anyone ever been in a situation like that? But, also, but when we pray in the Holy Spirit, we pray courageous prayers, and we're not confused, because we're praying, God's just praying through us. It's your, it's your heavenly prayer language, the Bible says. But, um, there was a story one time I heard for these uh, college students, they were in Bible school, and this one guy didn't have a lot of money, so Every night, he had about three jobs at the college. And so all night long, he was a janitor. He cleaned the toilets. He cleaned the classrooms. Every night, that was his job. Now, the other friends of his, they were out at Denny's and goofing off and hanging out and and doing what college people do. But every night, he decided he's why he cleans toilets. He's just going to pray in the Holy Spirit. He would pray in the Holy Spirit with his future in mind. When that group of friends graduated, the friends who just kind of, I mean, they graduated, they got their degree, but yet all of a sudden now they're like, okay, I don't know what God's will is, where do I go work, what church wants me. And here this guy stepped right out of being a janitor into a church, into a position. Why? Because he spent every night praying in the Holy Spirit, laying out a track about his future. Because his future was a mystery. His future was a, what if you prayed in the Holy Spirit about your future, you'd just be laying, because God knows your future that you don't. God gave us the Holy Spirit not to be something weird. There is nowhere in the Bible that it says, I want to fill you of my spirit so you'll be weird. <laughs> There's nowhere in the Bible. It, it, this is what God said. I want you to receive the Holy Spirit so you'll be filled with power. That word power is the Greek word dunamos, and it means dynamite. So what God says, I want to fill you with dynamite power. Well, God, I don't know if that's you. I don't think that's for today. No, I want to fill you with dynamite power. Is that God? That's the devil. Why would the devil want to fill you with dynamite power? That don't even make any sense, that argument. But he said, I want to fill you with dynamite, dynamite power. Y'all remember Jimmy Walker? Dynamite. He wants to fill you with dynamite power. And here you've been living this like half no power, trying to make it. You love Jesus. You just want Jesus to come back because you can't hardly get through life. And he said all along, I want to get inside of you and fill you with power. Okay, I got to keep going because of time. 1 Corinthians chapter 14, look at verse 4. So it enables us. Verse 4 says, he who speaks in tongues edifies himself. See, 
not only you enabled, but you are edified. You know what edified means? Built up. You know what it means right here? That you build a mega structure on the inside. Jude says when you pray in the Holy Spirit, your faith gets built up. Want to build yourself up against your insecurities? Pray in the Holy Spirit. It'll build you up. You know what you can quote? I can do all things through Christ. I can do all things through Christ. I can do all things through Christ. But when you quote that and you're praying in the Holy Spirit, guess what? You'll know. I can do anything through Christ who gives me strength. Because he always edifies the word, magnifies the word. Last thing, look at this, verse 14 and 15. For if I pray in a tongue, my spirit prays, but my understanding is unfruitful. What's the conclusion? Well, I'm going to pray with the spirit. I'm going to pray with understanding. I'm going to sing in the spirit. I'm going to sing with understanding. Paul said this, I pray in tongues more than all of you. Ephesians says this, be praying in the Holy Spirit always. Here's the other thing that it does. So it enables you, it edifies you, and, and, and it energizes you. Isaiah actually says when you pray in the Holy Spirit, you're refreshed. Have you ever just felt like you couldn't keep going? I mean, you love Jesus, you love the word, you go to church, but sometimes you're just like, I can't take that, I'm just, I feel worn out. The Bible promises when we pray in the Holy Spirit, we're refreshed. So the, today, what I want you to receive is this. Just like last week, I wanted to teach you how to get rooted in the Word of God and use the Word of God. Today, I want, you, I want to teach you how do I get rooted in prayer. Because, see, you're going to need some roots when some storms come. I didn't say if they came. I said when they came. And you might be in a storm right now. Or maybe you just came out of one. If you didn't come out of one and you're not in one right now, i got bad news. There's one somewhere down the road. We just face the storms of life. Not a bad face statement. We just face storms. How, how do you, we have to be rooted. Just like roots are there to keep us anchored. Doesn't matter what storm comes your way if you're anchored. Those roots are going to absorb the good things from God. And they're going to arm your life. We do that by knowing, not just read the Bible, but be transformed this book like we talked about last week and this week next week we're going to talk about being rooted in worship don't miss that but this morning i'm not telling you how long you're supposed to pray or where you're supposed to pray or when you're supposed to, i'm just telling you these are some things this is how we pray to be effective in praying i'm going to be consistently calm that doesn't mean i'm not firm with, but i'm going to be consistently calm because i'm praying to the father it's all good look at someone say it's all good why i'm praying to the father I said, I'm praying to the Father. And I'm going to be consistently confident. Why? Because I'm praying in the name of Jesus. Let's do something real quick here. Everybody say God. Now I want you to say Jesus. Say God. Jesus. See, there's a difference. Here's why. God can mean lots of different things to lots of different people. But when you know you say the name of Jesus, the Bible says every knee, cancer bows at the name of Jesus. Diabetes bows at the name of Jesus. Heart disease bows at the name. Poverty bows at the name of Jesus. Every demon in hell launched on this earth bows at the name of Jesus. Don't believe me? Get up tomorrow morning, take your problem, tape it to your mirror, and say in the name of Jesus, you're going to start bowing. You're going to start bowing. That's pretty courageous. Yeah. God doesn't want you just to barely get by. Just holding on to Jesus. Just come back, Jesus. We're just holding on. Come on. He said, I'm going to fill you with my spirit. You're going to be full of dynamite power. Come on, we're praying to get out of here. God's saying, impact this world. I didn't call you to hide. I called you to call in the harvest. Have some boldness. Power. We got a bunch of spiritual wimps in the church. Not you guys. They were on the early service. <laughs> guys, I'm going to get my spirit in you. I'm going to change you from the inside out. So I'm going to challenge you. Let's start getting into the Word because when you get in the Word, the Word gets in you. And let's just learn to pray. I don't care if it's 10 minutes. 10 minutes praying right is better than an hour praying wrong. You can wobble around and fret for an hour in prayer or you can take 10 minutes and pray heaven down. If you've got a 10-minute drive, turn off the morning show 
and just, I'm, I'm not saying you can't listen, don't take it wrong, just turn that off and pray in the Holy Spirit. If you've got a taxing job, if you're a teacher, if you're a nurse, pray. When you get out of your car, you walk into school, all hell's going to be scared of you. But don't drive all the way to work like, I don't want to count these kids, dude, that's terrible. These kids these days, God, why'd you put me there? Just take us home, Jesus. Don't pray that prayer. How about pray, God, I know I can't get up and preach in school, but you can send the loneliest kids in my class. And I can just love them for six, eight hours a day. And they might be the next Billy Graham. I mean, they might be the next senator. They might, they might just, God, I'm a nurse. I'm so sick of these sick people. Just complain and sick and how about you just pray in the Holy Spirit when you're on your way there and something will happen that day that you weren't trained for that you're able to do that save somebody's life. That's how God works. I remember one time God woke my, my wife up. She wakes up all the time and just prays. I wish I could tell you I did that. I wake up, I'm like, hungry, I'm hungry, I need an Oreo. <laughs> But she just, I remember this one time she started praying. She didn't know why she was awake or praying. She kept seeing this little girl. She just prayed in the Holy Spirit because she didn't know how to pray. And like two days later, they found this little girl. And it was the little girl she saw in prayer. And she, someone kidnapped her and she got rescued. That's not because she's just awesome. It's just like she decided to pray. I remember one time, this is years ago now. I, I, I know i got to let you out of here. But I am. Um, I remember um, I was in college, I was a freshman, I was in Indiana, and I kept being woken up. And my mom said, if you get woken up with someone on your mind, just pray. If you don't know what's going on, pray in the Holy Spirit. So my aunt kept coming to my mind, and I just started praying in the Holy Spirit. I didn't know what it was for. So finally I called home, I'm like, I, keep, I kept praying for my aunt. And I said, well, they rushed her to D.C. with a heart attack or something like that. I had no idea, I hadn't seen her. I'm just praying. And she, was, she ended up being saved. I said, was that because you prayed? Probably. You know how many times God just wants to say, I got to get something done in the earth, but God does it in a legal manner. So he's going to tap us on the shoulder and let us pray. Have us pray. Praying is interacting with God and it's getting the purposes of God into our life and into the earth. Let's all stand. Anyone get something good this morning?